Get your Heavenly Highway hymn books out tonight. Let's turn to page number 24. Page number 24 in your Heavenly Highway hymn books tonight. Oh, say, but I'm glad. Page number 24 tonight. Page number 24 in your Heavenly Highway hymn books tonight. Page number 24. There is a song in my heart today, something I've never had. Jesus has taken my sins away. Number 56 tonight, he whispers sweet peace to me. Number 56. <clears throat> Page number 56. Page number 56. Sometime when misgivings darken the day and face light I cannot see, I ask my dear Lord to brighten the way. He whispers sweet peace to me.
tonight to Genesis chapter 42. Genesis chapter 42. This will be, I don't know if we get through it tonight, this will be our last uh, deal on the life of Joseph in uh, comparing his life as a type of Jesus Christ. Welcome to everybody online and welcome to everybody that's here. We're glad that you're here tonight. Appreciate people making the effort. I was driving to church tonight and it's only about four minutes for me to get here, uh, maybe ten minutes, about four, four, four and a half miles. And I think, Lord, these a lot of people drive, you know, 20 and 30 and 40 miles to get here, maybe 50 miles. And uh, I, I, they're, they're probably more spiritual than I am. Okay, <laughs> but anyway. Now tonight what I want to do is, is uh, put on mic. I thought I had it on, boys, but we'll look at it again. It is not on. Um, thank you. Um, I want to try to really roll and go here so we can get into prayer time. But... Uh, Joseph, uh, let's go back through his, his story a little bit. You know, he, was, he was the firstborn from Rachel. He was already a bunch of brothers had been born up to that time. But he's his father's uh, firstborn as far as he's concerned from Rachel, his, his wife that he originally purchased or made a deal for. And uh, <clears throat> Joseph loves him special. And he gave him a coat of many colors. And God gave Joseph dreams that his brethren would bow down to him, his parents. And... Um, then they hated him, envied him. Uh, his father sent Joseph later on down to check on the brethren. And in their hatred and envy toward him, they uh, put him in a pit and they were going to kill him. One of the brothers stayed off that. And then some Midianites came through. They sold him as a slave into Egypt. And down in Egypt, why he, of course, is sold as a slave, uh, Potiphar's house and so forth. Uh, then he's lied on by Potiphar's wife, put in prison then, and a lot of prophetic things happened. We went through all these things. It's a picture of Jesus Christ. And, uh, and uh, of course, raised up in the end to rule over Egypt. Last week, or last time we was here on Wednesday night, we looked at Joseph and his brethren. They're still up in Canaan land. Joseph's down here in Egypt. He is the, uh, you know, on the throne of Egypt. And they came down to Egypt looking for corn. Last week we looked at that, that those brethren, first of all, were a picture of the nation Israel being reconciled to Jesus Christ uh, at the end of the tribulation period and how Israel will be converted to Christ. Now, this may not be a big deal to you, but I promise you it's a big deal to God. God, in, before history ever started, before the world ever was, God laid, foreordained all this. And God loves them. And God is going to restore them. And that last week, that's what we, we taught on and so forth. This week, we want to take the same story and apply it evangelically in the evangelization or the saving of a lost sinner. And what we're going to look at is how Joseph Christ takes lost sinners and draws them to himself and how they're saved. There's two things I want you to do tonight. And I want you to get active in this. And if you've got a thought, question, something, throw in, go for it. I want you to go on two levels. Number one, I want you to think about how you were saved, when you were saved, and how God dealt with you. Uh, I just have a three, or actually it's a five-page letter from a, a 17, 18-year-old girl in Seattle, Washington, who's been watching online and what, what God's dealing with. And, but I want you to go way back, especially if, if you can think, how did God deal with you about being saved? And how did you realize later as you looked back about how God got saved? And then here's what I want you to think about. This church is, you know, we're planting seed constantly, planting seed everywhere we can, every way we can. How's God dealing with people out here about being saved? How does God deal with the lost man? How is he drawing to himself? What, what's going on in the spiritual realm for that to happen. And here's why this is important to us is because if we're not careful, we'll come up with our own means and our own devices to try to get people to get saved. This lesson is going to tell you some wonderful, great biblical truths about how to work with God in, in drawing people to Christ instead of working at odds trying to get people saved or messing up the work that God's doing to draw people in. And and, and we'll, we're gonna, I don't know whether we'll get through this tonight. But if you have lost loved ones, 
you have lost friends, I want you to listen carefully and I want you to think and I want you to get synced up with God how he is going to lead his brethren to him. How Joseph Christ is going to lead these lost sinners to himself. And all that's going on, that's going to go on and the time frame that's going to go on. And this is very encouraging because we want to see instant results. We want stuff to happen right now. We want to see stuff with our eyes. But the Holy Spirit is constantly working behind the scenes, drawing people to Christ. And we have to keep this in mind. So we're going to take off tonight. Lord, help us tonight to feed the flock of God and help us, God, to get a hold of these truths. Lord, we want to win men to Christ. We want to see people saved. And God, we want to do it right. We want to work in, in union with you. We want to be yoked up with you. And Lord, let you lead us and direct us. And so Lord, teach us tonight some of these deeper truths about how men are brought to Christ. What's going on behind the scenes. Help us to understand this and see it, Lord, because it'll give us faith to know that though we don't see things externally, we know that you're working. And we know that you will do what you said you would do. So Lord, give us wisdom tonight, I pray. And make, help me, Lord, to be clear and plain so that children can understand what we're saying tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. In chapter 42, we'll just take off in chapter 42. Uh, the Bible said, Now Jacob saw that there was corn in Egypt. And Jacob said to his sons, Why look ye upon one another? And he said, Behold, I have heard that there's corn in Egypt. Go ye down thither and buy for us thence, that we may live and not die. And Joseph's ten brethren went down to buy corn in Egypt. Now, the first thing we want to say is that the land that the brethren were living in, there was no corn. Now, corn in this story is a picture of spiritual life or spiritual sustenance or spiritual food. It's almost a picture of salvation. They were in a place, they didn't, they had no access to corn. They had no access to food. They had no access. And in the world, the world doesn't have spiritual food. The world doesn't have what people are needing and looking for. The spiritual life, I, I, I just I can't help, but my mind's on this young lady and she talks about her journey uh, of faith and how God just totally changed her life in the last two or three years. And, and so, the, but the world doesn't have any corn. They don't have the truth. They don't have the gospel. So if, so if a person's going to get, so, but God can put hunger in people. There, can I be honest with you? I believe America's full of people who really want to know how to go to heaven, but they've heard so much junk and stuff and seen so much junk, they don't know what to think. Amen. And I want to tell you something. This needs to be a place where they can come and get corn. Amen. This needs to be a place where the food is there, and, and they can hear, watch this, they can hear that there's corn over here. You know, even a big buck will do that. <laughs> Amen. And so, but, you know, to be honest with you, you hear about a good restaurant, what happened? You'll probably wind up there. Yeah. Some old boy said, man, live, y'all go down there. Man, they'll feed you there. People go there. And uh, we need to be a place where the world, people out here in the world can say, you know what? That, that's why, I'm, I mean, we may not hear lots of stuff about these handles. I'm going to tell you right now, I know God will use those, those, those booklets. I don't have any question in my mind. Number one, I ask him to. Number two, it's his word. He, number three, he told us to do it. He told us to do it. He's going to use it. There'll be, there'll be things this church won't find out about till we get in glory land. And we live by faith. We just obey God and let the Holy Spirit do the work behind. Amen? Amen. Now, so we ought to understand that, by the way, the prodigal son. Now, there's a lot of, some people look at the prodigal son two ways. You, you might be able to look at it in two ways. One way is that he's a lost sinner uh, away from God, and he comes home and gets saved. The other is he's a, Christian, he's a saved person and got away from God. I tend to lean to the one that he's lost, but I, I, I do. Because there's also a picture of that, of the Jewish deal with the prodigal son. But the prodigal son, you know, what, what did he say? He said, I'm down here in the hog pen. I ain't got nothing to eat. Man, there's food to spare up my father's house. Yeah. See, the, whether we admit it, people won't admit this, but people are hungry spiritually. Their spirits are empty. Yeah. I want to tell you something, uh, you know, money and, 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 and parades and, and all that stuff and all the fun the world can give you, it will not satisfy that place that God should be residing in your soul. Amen. And I'll tell you something, you can, be in, you can be in prison, a lifer. You can be doing life in prison and have peace and joy with Jesus living in your heart. There are people doing it everywhere. I mean, there are people doing it all over the world. Yeah. Only Christ can feel that. And so they, they, the prodigal son is saying, that with no spiritual food, he said, I'm going to the Father's house. 
So, number two, <clears throat> not only number one, the world doesn't have any corn, and there ought to be a place where they can go get corn. They ought to be able to hear about it. Faith comes by what? Hearing. They heard there was corn in Egypt. Man, I tell you, well, go out of here. And, I mean, I'll just be honest with you. We ought to go out, out of here and say, man, alive, you should have been to church Sunday. Well, how come? You just ought to come see. You just ought to come see. I mean, just being honest with you, sometimes you have to salt the oats a little bit, amen? But people are looking for truth. I really believe this with all my heart. Number two, Joseph's brethren, <clears throat> this, this, this is wild. They, look at verse number three, or verse number two, and about the middle of it. He said, go down there to Egypt, thither, and buy for us thence that we may live and not die. Joseph, ten brethren, went down to buy corn in Egypt. Verse number five, and the sons of Israel came to buy corn. Go down to verse number seven, last two, three words. And from the land of Canaan to buy food. Verse number 10, and they said unto him, nay, my Lord, but to buy food. Five times in ten verses, Joseph's brethren, picture of the lost sinner, wants to go down where there is corn. But he thinks he's got to buy it. That's the, if that ain't a picture of a lost man, I never saw nothing. Lost people think, as a, I, I'm, I was the same way. I thought how good I was, my earning or my meriting might get me into heaven. Amen. We're going to somehow or another buy our way into heaven by, by the good grace. We're, we're going to be good enough. We're going to give enough. We're going to do enough. But you can't buy salvation, right? Amen. It's a gift. <clears throat> See, everything... Do we, when somebody says, well, we're not under the law, we're not under work, uh, that's, that's right. But when you say, when somebody says they're keeping the law to be saved, what they're doing is saying, I'm being saved by my performance and God's going to reward my performance. Yep. Or if I'm saved by my works, God is going to, see, the, salvation becomes a reward and not a gift. That word by is in there, is a, that mean the Holy Ghost put that in there because it's telling you that, the lost man's natural inclinations is to try to earn his way to heaven and earn approval and acceptance to God. You can't do it. Amen. For by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. If it's a gift, you can't buy it. So, so that's something you want to keep in mind. Lost people kind of walk in thinking, well, I may have to straighten up. Maybe if I straighten up, change my ways, God will accept me. I'll be approved. I can get corn. What's the prophet say? He said, come buy without money and price. Amen. That's right. And, and, and we've got to get this done. But people have a tendency to think it's how good they are or what they do or so forth that somehow or another merits them getting corn. All right. Number three. Watch this, chapter 42, verse number 7. So they get down there, verse number 7. Joseph saw his brethren, and he knew them, but made himself strange to them. Well, ain't that funny? Jesus, oh, here's one of the great secrets about salvation. Did you know that you'll not get saved till the Holy Ghost reveals Christ and the cross to you? He has to reveal your lost condition, has to reveal the cross, what the cross did, and it's all... But when a person first comes to God, if you come, watch this, if you come to God thinking that you're going to merit salvation, he'll make himself strange to you. You won't see him. You won't, you won't get Christ. You might get church, but you won't get Christ. Amen. And he'll make himself strange. Not only that, but looks at, and spake roughly unto them. See, we come, yeah, there you go, the law. <laughs> He's going to lay it out to you, spake rough. Well, I was coming to church to, I thought it was going to be, I thought it was going to be nice. And that preacher just got up and preached every, on everything. I, somebody told him I was coming to church. Somebody told him, so he spake roughly. <clears throat> I got so tickled. <clears throat> Sunday morning I said something about hollering. A lady talked to me after church. She said, that's what I exactly said. I said, why are you hollering for? <clears throat> she was like, Dan said, raise your voice. That doesn't mean, but we tend to think that if I come to God and say, God, I want to buy salvation, I want to go to heaven, what, how much it's going to cost me, what do you want me to do? <clears throat> we tend to think God said, well, sure, glad to see you. God says, uh-uh, I'm not even going to show you who I am. I'll speak roughly to you. You don't even know what this is about yet. You don't know anything about being saved. If you think you can buy it, and you think you can just walk up to me and tell me you're married about being saved. You don't know. God speaks roughly to them. He rough to them. Okay, now watch this. <clears throat> and he said unto them, When's come ye? 
And they said, From the land of Canaan to buy food. And Joseph knew his brethren, but they knew him not. And Joseph remembered the dreams he dreamed of them, said to them, You're spies. <laughs> I, think, I think that's funny. Can you imagine them boys head jerking when he said that? He said, You're spies to see the nakedness of the land you're coming. And they said, Unto him, oh, no, nay, my Lord, but to buy food are thy servants come. We're all one man's son. We are true men. Now, I want to tell you something. My daddy used to say, when a man sits around telling you all the time that he don't never lie, and, he's, and I'm telling you the truth, you watch out because he's fixing to lie to you. <laughs> watch out for the guy that brags on himself about how honest he is. Amen. Now, it's, it, we can get a, a, a habit of saying, now, I'm going to tell you the truth, and I've done that. I do that. But I'm going to tell you something. The, here's, the, here's the third thing in the big one. These guys are as self-righteous as they can possibly be. See, they didn't come to God for mercy. They came to buy a, a, a acceptance with God. God speaks roughly to them, accuses them, and they start telling how good they are. And that's what happens when people want, want to be saved. They'll start talk, thinking about how good I am, right? You ever think about that? Just how good? Did you know that, that people will come into church sometimes for months and years, and they're actually, what they're thinking about is, hey, it, they're kind of looking around, and, well, I look like I'm just good as the rest of them. There's people, I'm just going to be honest with you, I was 28 years old when I got saved. Been in church all my life. If you'd have walked in, if somebody said, caught me outside the church house door and said, Reg, are you saved? I said, well, yeah. I'm true, man. I, I ain't coming in here lying and playing hypocrite. <laughs> I'll tell you the truth. See, God had to speak roughly to me. I'll tell you how rough God got with me. You're a hypocrite. You're a liar. You're a phony. That ain't something you want to hear from God. You can sit in church a long time. It may, may, may take a long time for that truth to bust through on you. You just, you may, I, I hate to say this, but a lot of times people, people are just growing up thinking, it, mamas don't ever tell your kids, now you be good you'll go, so you can go to heaven. You ain't going to go to heaven being good because you ain't good enough. Right. Don't tell your kids that. Love your kids, but be kind to them. Be honest with them. Sin is sin, and teach them what sin is. They'll find it out quick enough. But I'm just saying, teach them what sin is. They'll, fig they'll figure that out if you'll talk to them. But they say, we're true men. Christ wounds before he heals. Any good surgeon has to wound you before you get ill. You're going to cut you first. Then they're going to go in and do the work. God wounds before he heals. He leads us to... No, here's, here's the big thing. Man, wa man wants to slide in kind of real slick-like and be accepted with God on his own terms. God is not going to allow that. God is going to require what? Re truth in your heart. I'm going to tell you something. God, don't monkey with lying. And you'll never be saved till you start getting truthful in your own heart. You'll never get saved unless you admit you're a sinner and deserve hell. As long as you think, well, I'm a true man. I'm a pretty good guy. You'll never be saved. And God, well, what was he doing with them? He was leading them to truth. What did David say? Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. I mean, just, let's just look at it this way. I mean, just look at it. What use have you of a Savior or lost men have a Savior if he's not guilty? If Jesus died on the cross for sinners and you don't need him, you're saying you're not a sinner. You'll never be saved. You know why? Because you're self-righteous. You fool yourself. Amen. We're true men. Just about, what, were, what, were they, what, what was the truth about them? Let's, tell, let's just say, man, let's just tell the truth about them. What was the truth about them men? Huh? Deceivers. They're deceivers. What had they done? They'd sold their brother into slavery. Lied to their father. Lied to their father. Tried to cover it up. Made their father live in misery for years. Made their father live in misery. 
and then turn around and say, we're true men. That's, that's the flesh nature of us. Our flesh will try to paint ourselves out. As, well, you know, we're not so bad. Surely I won't go to hell. I ain't that bad. They were bad. Right. They're just like me and you, they were bad. And so the Lord's going to lead them. Number four, let's look what God does. Uh, he gets down there and Joseph, verse 14. Let's look at verse 14. Joseph said, into, I get, I'm getting to, let's just do verse 13. He said, uh, they said, thy servants are 12 brethren, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And behold, the youngest is this day with our father. And one is not. <laughs> it's talking to him. <laughs> it's talking to his not. <laughs> we, uh, we got the 12 of us. One's back with dad and one is not. And that is not standing right there. There's talking to him. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you about it. Oftentimes, God is dealing with us right in front of our face and we don't recognize it. There are things happening in your life tonight, today, and God is trying to reach you and you don't even recognize it. You just, we just can't see it. But God is leading us to himself. Anyway, he said, verse 14, Joseph said unto them, this, that, that, this is that that, I, that is that, that I spake unto you, saying, you're spies. Hereby shall you be proved. He said, you say you're true men, let's just prove you. By the life of Pharaoh, you shall not go forth hence, except your younger brother come hither. Send one of you and let him fetch your brother, and you shall be kept in prison, that your words may be proved, whether there be any truth in you. Or else by the life of Pharaoh, surely ye are spies. And he put them all together in ward three days. <laughs> now, this is what God does to a lost man. He puts you in spiritual jail, and you deserve to be there. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. Terry's done jail work for Blue Moon. I, my, I've, I've done jail work. And J Terry, have you ever walked? Who, all, who else has helped Terry in jail work right here tonight? Anybody help Terry? Just, back here, huh? Bill, have you ever walked there and seen somebody you knew? Oh, yeah, me too. I walked there, was shocked to see some people that was in there. Going over there on Wednesday night, and the guy looked up and said, Red Skull, boy, never thought I'd see you here. And you see the shame on their face. I want to tell you something. The whole deal is sin should bring shame, and sin should bring punishment, condemnation. We're not going, to, a lost man's not going to be condemned. He's condemned already. He didn't have to have court. Them guys was guilty. They just wouldn't admit it. They, they, supposed, they should have been in jail. They, they, they would have committed murder if they hadn't come up with the idea of selling him. They were murderers. They were thieves. They were men stealers. They were everything. In fact, Timothy talks about that. They were everything. You know what? They were just getting what they deserved. I'm going to tell you something. Now, don't, don't lose me right here. But a lot of things that happens to a lost man is God spiritually putting him in prison. He's in a prison of his own guilt. And God's going to put you there. And you can't run from it. You can't get drunk enough to forget it. You can't dope out enough to forget it. You can't grow enough marijuana to forget it. You can't make enough money to forget it. You can't have a good enough time to get away from it. God's going to put you in jail. And your conscience is going to tear your guts out. Amen. This is good for you. God, see, God ain't messing with this stuff about man-made slipping into heaven stuff. God's going to bring us to truth, repentance, and reality. And that's the way it's going to be. Well, he put them where they ought to be. Then number five, they were smitten in their conscience. Now, this is where it gets dicey. Look at verse number 21. Well, he started at verse number 19. If ye be true, man, let one of your brethren be bound in the house of your prison. Go ye carry corn for the famine of your houses, and bring me your youngest brother unto me. So shall your words be verified. Ye shall not die, and they did so. Now watch verse 21. And they said, now this is powerful. Watch this. They said one to another, we are barely guilty concerning our brother in that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us and we would not hear. Therefore is this distress come upon us. Who brought up the subject of the other brother? They did. They did. 
How many times a day do you think those brothers who sold their brother into Egypt thought about what they had done to that man? You better be glad you got a conscience. And don't sear it. Don't harden yourself against a conscience. God put it in you. How many times? And so what's happening? They're put in jail. They're put into all the, God's putting the pressure on them. And all of a sudden, they start having this conversation among themselves about somebody that nobody had brought up but they themselves that didn't even know about. They said, they, but there's a problem here. Now watch this. They said one to another. In the New Testament, it says this, comparing ourselves among ourselves, we are not wise. Did you know, I just talked to Brother Chris a while ago how we deal with problems. You know how one of the ways we deal with problems is? Well, everybody has them. So we console ourselves that everybody's got problems. But I'm going to tell you something. That don't take away a problem. That don't fix a problem. It may give you some, a little bit of salve to get through, to go get, uh, handle the problem somewhat, but it don't fix the problem. The problem of your sin is not going to be taken care of by comparing yourselves among yourselves and saying, well, if they make it to heaven, I'll sure make it, or I guess I'll just go to hell with my buddy. You cannot, you're not to compare yourself. The Bible says he that compares, if you compare yourself among yourselves, you're not wise. If you're not wise, you're stupid. It is stupid to compare yourself to other people. And you say, well, uh, I haven't done what they done. I haven't done what he done. I haven't done what well, everybody in here, if we'd all got caught, all of us be in jail now. You know I'm telling you the truth. <laughs> Some of you just now fell in that trap. Well, I hadn't. You said among yourselves, well, I hadn't. But the, your problem is, watch this. Here's the whole problem. We're looking vertical, and we're looking horizontal with, among men, and we're not looking up. Because man's standard ain't nothing. It changes day by day. You look up, and what's God's standard? Absolute, perfect holiness and righteousness. Now compare yourself to that. See, the problem is with one to another. We'll sit around church as long as it's everything we want to talk about. As long as it fits into our, you know, our little groove, we'll have no problem with it. But if we look to the Bible, the Bible says whatsoever not a faith is sin. Grab this one here. He that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him is sin. What are you going to do? He said, well, man alive, you don't give nobody no hope. Well, I ain't done yet. But, but I'm not holding out some fig leaf, you, some man-made fig leaf to take care of your sin problem. You've got to become completely lost, completely guilty, own up to it, fess up to it, come clean with it, and then and only then when you realize you can't save yourself, then you might start looking for a savior. Amen. The gospel will come attractive. So this, is what, this is why Brother Mitch wanted to go about the law. If you're witnessing and you're talking to your loved ones, and I know some of you are going to be sitting around Thanksgiving table, and I know your whole deal is, we, well, we, we, we need to get along. Do you really? You don't get along, let everybody die and go to hell? Now, I didn't say jump up at the t kitchen table and say, everybody quiet on the table about you're this, you're that. I didn't say that. But you know what you might want to do is, walk, is, is talk to people and say, listen, your righteousness is filthy rags, just same as mine. You ain't going to make it to heaven on your own good works. You're never going to be good enough to go to heaven. You're just, you're just as bad as I am. You need a Savior. What are you doing about it? But we don't want to tell people. We don't want to hurt nobody's feelings. Let me just tell you something. You know why they hated Jesus? Because he hurt their feelings. You know why they hated John the Baptist? He hurt their feelings. America makes me sick. We don't want to hurt nobody's feelings. We want our safe space. Yeah. You know where most people's safe space is? Not in a church where there's preaching on sin. That's the safe space. <laughs> <laughs> Everything offends everybody. You make me sick. Yeah. You make God sick. Yeah. You need to be offended. All of us are sorry, hell-deserving, worthless, no-account sinners that should have been in hell and hadn't been for the mercy of God, you'd be in there right now. Amen. The breath he's given you is opportunity for you to be saved. Repent of your sin and trust Jesus Christ that he died for you. I'm just being honest. This is good stuff. This is real. God ain't messing with God. Ain't. 
Think, oh, you think this, if you think this is the New Testament, rich young ruler came to Jesus Christ. What must I do to inherit eternal life? If Jesus had been the average New, Te New Testament church and preacher, he'd say, well, now listen, you are sincere, aren't you? Well, yeah, I wouldn't have been asking if it was sincere. Well, let's bow our heads together and you repeat after me. Dear God, dear God, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. Bless your heart. You're saved now. You know what Jesus said? He didn't, Jesus didn't even give him the gospel. You know why Jesus didn't give him the gospel? Because he knew that guy's so full of pride and selfishness. And stuff, he wouldn't listen to the cross. The cross meant nothing to him. If you don't know you're a sinner, the cross doesn't mean nothing to you. You think you're good enough to go to heaven? The cross don't mean nothing to you. Jesus knew he's full of pride. And he was, didn't he? Jesus said, thou knowest the law. Oh, he said, all them things that I've done since my childhood up. He's lying like a dog. He hadn't done all them things since his childhood up. No more than you have. Set there, and lied, set there and lied right in the face of Jesus Christ. I've kept all the law. No, he hadn't. And you know what Jesus did? He let him go. We're going to see why, because Joseph's going to let these boys go pretty soon. Sometimes it takes time for the Holy Spirit to do a deep work in the heart where, where they realize, I need Christ. Ain't, I, I, religion's not going to get me. Well, they were smitten in their conscience, but, just, but, but they were looking out and not up. Now, number six, Joseph does something. Now, this is wild. In, in, in four, chapter 42, verse number 25. Then Joseph, well, listen, back up here. Verse 22, and Reuben answered him, spake, spake I not unto you, saying, did not sin against the child, and you would not hear, and now they're arguing among themselves and accusing each other. Therefore, behold, also his blood is required. Well, I mean, their conscience is bugging the day. Their sin is finding them out, right? They knew not that Joseph understood them. <laughs> Can you imagine him standing there listening to all that garbage? Wow. Verse number 22, and they knew, verse 24, and he turned about him from them and wept. I'm going to tell you something. Jesus wept over Jerusalem. He wept at the tomb of Lazarus. And I want to tell you right now, he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Amen. God has a heart of compassion and he loves you. Amen. He wants you to be saved. And returned to them again and communed with them and took from them Simeon and bound him before their eyes. He's, he's putting him in for surety. And then Joseph commanded to fill their sacks with corn and restore every man's money into his sack and give them provision for the way. And thus did he unto them. They laid their asses with the corn, departed thence, and one of them opened his sack to give his ass provender. And then he espied his money. For behold, it was in the sack's mouth. And he said unto his brother, My money is restored, and lo, it is even in my sack. I, I, thought, I thought I could buy my way in heaven. It didn't work. Now I've got the corn and I got my money. Their hearts failed them. Now, now their hearts being dealt with. God is just laying them out. Now, to be honest with you, this is no different than you walking into a court scene and a prosecuting attorney, attorney has every intent on putting you behind bars. He's going to drag up everything you've ever done. He's going to bring in every angle about it. And he's going to try to convince that jury that you are worthy of death or the pen or whatever it may be. The Holy Spirit is going to bring you to a place of this is, listen to me, this is why we've got so much junk in this country in faith. It's because we want people to be saved without their repenting and be, knowing they're guilty. This is why when you, you, get, you get somebody that goes through this, through conviction, and through understand their guilt, they will endure. <laughs> I'll tell you, I'll tell you, they won't just jump out the next little bump in the road. Amen. They'll go through the fire because they, they understand the value of it. Well, they, uh, so now, he put the money back in the sack. So what did God do? He rejected their self-righteousness. Can't buy your way into heaven. And their hearts were failed. They said, what is this that God hath done unto us? <laughs> there are lots of things going on. They're remembering their sins. They're, they, all of a sudden now, God, they, God's getting involved in this thing. And this is what's going on behind the scenes that you and I don't see with people. But they've got to be given the gospel. And they've got to be given, if, they, if they're proud, give them the law. Don't give a man that's proud the gospel. He don't appreciate it. Give him the law. 
But what God did here, he starts giving them grace, okay? The money back in the sack is indicative of grace. You cannot buy salvation. Salvation is by grace. It's free. It's a gift. All right. And it said there in verse 29, They came unto Jacob their father in the land of Canaan and told him all that befell them. The man who is the Lord of the land spake roughly to us and took us for spies. <laughs> and we said unto him, We're true men. We're no spies. And they go on that, that little line they had all rained out there. But what he does, when he puts that money back in her sack, he introduces grace to them guys. But the world thinks that it's by living good and by, being, by turning over a new leaf and all that junk. Number seven, the brethren have an interim period. And this is, they have a space period. And this is one of the things I want to hit tonight. Verse 26 says, They laid their asses with the corn and departed. They left out of Egypt. They left the presence of Christ not saved. They walked out of the service not saved. They weren't ready yet. Now, this is big. Joseph, a picture of Christ, knew they were not ready for him to be revealed to them. Their conscience was stirred. There was some guilt going on. They were troubled. But they were humble. They weren't, they, weren't, they weren't really honestly admitting their guilt to God. It was discussed. It was kind of acknowledged in a, in a humanistic way. I have a little problem with this, and I, I say it, and it is biblical. It's one thing to say, we have all sinned. It's another thing to say, I am a sinner. You'll never get saved if you only go as far as we've all sinned. You'll never get saved till you say, I'm a sinner. I am a sinner. This is where God is taking these guys to. It's not just a general discussion. An intellectual assent. Well, everybody sins. He's bringing to a place of personal responsibility. Well, they have this time. And it's at this point where people's conscience have been stirred. They may have went to a revival meeting. They may have been in a church service. Somebody may give them a track. Somebody talked to them. The Holy Spirit just dealing with them. They may have heard a preacher on TV. You never know. And they may go on down the road six months, six years. But here's something I want you to get. Planting the seed. The Holy Spirit's the only one who can make life. But you and I can plant the seed. But the seed has been planted that you boys have got a problem and you better get something done about it. You are guilty. You are condemned. And there's a God in heaven who knows it. You better get something done about it. But there's this time span. Now, is there anybody in here, you were convicted, but you didn't get saved till some time later? Did anybody in here get a testimony to that? Terry. Yeah, I went to church, got convicted really bad, but I really didn't know how to get saved. There you go. These boys, to be honest with you, these, these guys really didn't either. You see, that's why sincerity will not save us. Amen. Even the good intentions will not save us. And by the way, people need to know how to be saved. They need to know that Christ died and paid that death penalty for them on the cross. <clears throat> and faith in him coming to Christ with the repentance of sin and admission of sin. I'm a guilty sinner receiving Christ. God saved them on that basis. They're not going to be saved basis by quitting drinking, quitting smoking, quitting chasing women, quitting this and quitting that and quitting that. That'll never save you. You'll die and go to hell quitting everything. <laughs> you won't get saved getting baptized. You won't get saved going to church. And I'm telling you, it's Christ and Christ alone that saves. And this is what he's getting, getting to here. Well, in verse number 27 and 28, their, their heart failed them. They were afraid. What's going on? Romans 10 says, if man believes with the heart. Where, where, does, where does things have to start happening for a man to get saved? Here or here? The heart. For with the heart, man believeth unto salvation. Here's the difference between religion and all the religions and junk you can sweep up around the world and biblical Christianity and salvation. It's that God deals with your heart. And you're saved by working the heart. And when the Holy Ghost of God begins to deal in your heart, Man, you're in trouble with God. 
you got the wrath of God on you. You die like you are right now, you're going to bust hell wide open. Jesus Christ was to come, you're not going. You're lost. You're guilty. You're in trouble with God. See, here's what I'm getting to. This is why this, why this lesson is important to me. Very seldom are people being told you're in trouble with God. The wrath of God abiding on you. They're just kind of slicked up to an altar and slicked up to say a prayer and slicked up to be religious and slicked up to be baptized and then patted on the back and everything's all right. And somehow know they know. I mean, I deal with this all the time. That, that girl over in that letter, she talks about, you know, this shallow profession and got baptized and this kind of stuff. Anyway, she talks about that. But there was no peace. There's something wrong. Went through all this religious step. And just to be truthful with you, the Church of Christ and all them got through water baptism, we got our come to the altar. We got our little act. Now, I'm going to tell you something right now. You can get saved on a gravel road. You can get saved in a truck, a car. You can get saved at work. You can get saved anywhere where you and your heart come to God and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And I want to place my faith in Jesus Christ. And I want to receive him as my Savior. And I believe upon him. And you've been converted to Christ. And it's not somebody's little slick me up deal, religion deal. I'm telling you something I thankful, I'm thankful for and that God is real. And God don't monkey with us and play with us and tinker with us and fool us and deceive us and slick us around. God, God will save you forever, but it's, you got to be saved. All right. Now, so he disturbs her peace. Uh, <clears throat> in chapter 43, let's move on to chapter 43, verse 11. They get hungry again. They run out of food. And uh, so when you get to chapter 11, they're going to go back down there. Of course, they've got to bring their son if they go back down there. And so their father Israel said to them, if it must be so, now do this. Take the best fruits of the land your vessels. And I just love this. Carry down the manna present. A little balm and a little honey, spices, myrrh, nuts, and almonds. <laughs> they think that's going to buy them acceptance with Joseph, with Christ. Isn't that the way we are? Lord, if I, I, if I give you some, if I give some money here and I do this and I do that, Lord, I'll give you some nuts and some almonds and some little bit of honey and stuff. We think things are going to buy our way into heaven, earn our way into heaven. It's a lie. Well, he, uh, look at verse number 15. And the men took that present so that they get this nuts and honey and almonds and spices. <laughs> I mean, that's just, I laugh because that's just the way humanity is. And, but watch this, verse 15. And the men took that present and they took what, everybody? Double money. We're going to double our money. We're going to double our money and go back down. There. We ain't getting no peace. We got a taste of religion. Do you know in Hebrews it talks about tasting? That's right. Tasting the good things of God and yet not saved. Amen. But they're going to double them. So, so now, uh, we, we came to church, we went to church for two or three months, we made this little shallow profession, yeah, I know everybody sins, and yeah, I believe in Jesus with my head, but no salvation, and a little bit of tribulation came, and out you went. And so you went out there six, eight months, 12 months, maybe four years, five years, and, and, but all of a sudden, you're out of corn again, and your heart's empty, and your soul's empty, and, and you want God. And you say, well, we didn't take enough money with me last time. Let's double the money. So, Lord, this time, Lord, I'm 28 years old now. I quit drinking. Lord, I'm married now. I quit chasing the women. Uh, Lord, I, I quit stealing off people. Lord, I don't lie near as much as I used to. I've doubled my money. I've doubled my <laughs> Lord, I'm doubling everything up. You know what he's telling you? This, this, this is why we've got to wait on God to do it. Wait on God to do it. I know some people think I ought to give more, quote, public invitations than I do. But sometimes I just want you to go home and think about it. Sometimes there are lost people here, just go out in your car. And now, I think today's the day of salvation. The Bible says, for so now is the accepted time. But we really need to get, give the Holy Ghost to God time to work them over. We do, I'd, rather ha, I'd rather not have a profession than have a false profession. Amen. And so here he comes. He's, they're going to 
they're going to manifest their self-righteousness again. Well, you get down to chapter 43 and verse number 16. And uh, <clears throat> so here they go. Joseph saw Benjamin with them. He said to the ruler of his house, bring these men home and slay and make ready for these men shall dine with me at noon. You ever heard the song, Come, come and Dine? You ever heard the Bible illustration about salvation? Come, come. So now the Lord's, he's sending that invitation out to feast. Come and see and taste. The Lord is good. So he, he's sending that out to him. Now, <clears throat> I want you to go to real quick. Good land of living. This ain't working. It's 751. I want you to go do something. I want you uh, to prove this. To go to Matthew chapter 13. And go to verse number 20. <clears throat> now, this is the parable of sowers. This is all about gospel preaching, gospel witnessing, passing out tracts, soul winning, leading people to Christ, getting people to Christ. And when you get into chapter 13, <clears throat> and uh, he begins telling about that, verse number 20, is everybody there say amen? amen? All right. But he that receiveth the seed into stony places. Now, where is the seed of the gospel sown? And where was this seed sown? Stony places. Stony heart. Okay, now, now watch what happens to seed that is sown to a stony heart. Same, stony place. The same is he that heareth the word and anon with joy receiveth it. Woo Bless God Almighty. Woo Just so happy. Anybody ever seen people who claim to get saved and they're just so happy? And then six months later, the FBI couldn't find them to get them to church. And if you found them, you couldn't drag them here with a tractor and a log chain. I've seen, now listen to me, this is one of the reasons I've changed the way I operate. And I started preaching, buddy, I want to see results. Amen? I want to see results, and I want to see results now. And I ain't got time waking on the Holy Ghost. But man, we're going to get them stirred up, amen. And this is what a lot of churches are doing. Get you all the most. This is called, watch it, listen to me careful, soul worship. Soul worship will take you straight to hell. They that worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. Oh, but us preachers have figured out that we can get them all. Remember Brother, remember brother uh, Fields down here? And he said, when I get home, said, Sister Fields is going to ask me. He, here's what he did. He said, would everybody raise your hand? So we raised our hand. He said, good. He said, now when I get back home, I can tell Sister Fields that I moved you. Because she's going to ask me, did I move you? I'm telling you something right now. What we want to see is moves. So it makes us look good. Preachers like moves. So it makes them look good. Oh, your kid gets saved at the house. How can I get any glory out of that? You got saved at the job? Well, we missed a big exciting deal here at church. Now, I'm not against having a big exciting deal at church. You probably need a lot more of it. But I can tell you, I've seen, I remember, I'm thinking right now, a, a mother came one Sunday. Boy, I mean, it's been probably 15 years ago. And I've never seen anybody cry and snot and, and wail and go on. And, and man, supposedly got saved and then was so happy about it. Last time she ever came, never seen her again. All it was, she was in some temporal troubles. I was at a hospital one time. Going out through there, seen a neighbor over there. Walked in there, and I said, man, I didn't know he was in the hospital. <laughs> He took his shirt back. Well, there'd been big old staples, how they used to do the hearts, you know, and they big old staples all the way down. They'd cut his chest wide open. He said, I'll tell you one thing. You're going to see me in church when I get back down home. I guarantee you that. Me and God done some business here in the hospital. I tell you, he got my attention, man. I'll tell you, you just, you just mark it down in your calendar. When I get out of here and get home, you're going to see me there at church. <laughs> Boy, I'm glad to hear that, man. That's great. So you got saved? Yeah, I got saved. I went and seen him. 
He ain't interested in church. He got home, got feeling better. He ain't yeah. See, people get all emotional. Get a little, oh, God, you get me out of this trouble. I promise you I'll serve you until the day I die. And I don't lie. Yeah. Jesus telling you right here. He said, some of that seed's going to fall on stony hearts. They ain't no more broken. They're not broken. And they're going to jump and, and they're going to be anon with joy receive it. That's what you're looking at. That's where the guys, that's where they were, okay? I, uh, I don't know what to do. This is my last deal. Can I finish? It would be all right if I finish this. About four hours. No. I don't, I won't pray. I won't be honest with you. If, I'd had, if, I'd, if I hadn't had things together, we'd prayed first tonight. But I'm just going to finish it. I'll try to hurry. Okay, I'm just going to finish it because we're not all that far. Joseph, the, here's the thing about Joseph would not allow this surficial fellowship to continue. Now, how many knows they went in and ate with him? They sat down with him, they, but it was a surficial fellowship. Now, watch this. Watch out for a false conversion that has surface fellowship. Let me tell you about genuine biblical Christian fellowship. Love suffers long. You put up with people. Don't mean you like what they did or said or whatever it may be about. It. But you get into four, chapter 44 <clears throat> and verse number 1. And he commanded his steward of his house. Now that steward is the Holy Ghost. It's, the steward is the picture of the Holy Ghost. He's going to do some stuff for Joseph Christ. Of his house saying, fill the men's sacks with food as much as they can carry and put every man's money back in his sack. Or in his sack. And put my cup, the silver cup, in the sack's mouth of the youngest and the corn money. And he did according to the word that Joseph had spoken. <clears throat> as soon as the morning was light, the men were sent away and they had their asses. And they were gone up out of the city. And yet far off, Joseph said to his steward, up and follow after the men. <laughs> How many has ever had the Holy Spirit following you? <laughs> oh, man. I'm telling you, you talk about something getting me excited. And that's that. The Holy Spirit can go where no preacher can go. He can go where no daddy can go. He can go where no mama can go. And what you got to get is the Holy Spirit on their trail. And I tell you, the Holy Spirit will come down and say, Whoa, boys, take them sacks off your horse. Let's see what's in there. Let's open up. Watch this. Let's open up the sack of your life. Let's take a real hard look what's in your sack. And, of course, they open up the sack. <laughs> And here, this is funny. And uh, he, he says, uh, he said, when you overtake them, then verse 4, say unto them, wherefore have you rewarded evil for good? <laughs> is this not it which my Lord drinketh? And anyway, you know the story. He overtook them and said that to them. And boy, I mean, they just had, they just had themselves a spell. Verse number 20, behold the money which we found in our sack. We brought it again to thee out of the land of Canaan. They're still trumping their self-righteousness. Verse 8, how then should we steal out of that Lord's house silver or gold? With, and they say this, with whomsoever thy servant be found, let him die. And we, will, and we also will be my Lord's bondmen. And now also let it be according to your words. And he, <clears throat> and he with whom it is found, let be my servant, and ye shall be blameless. Then they speedily took down every man his sack to the ground, opened every man his sack. And he searched and began at the eldest and left it to the youngest. I wonder what they thought was going on. And the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Look at verse 13. And they rent their clothes. <laughs> I'm telling you what. They found out. Game's up. Get down to verse number 16. And Judah said, What shall we say unto my Lord? What shall we speak? Now he's fixing to be saved. What shall we say? I can't, tell, I can't tell God how good I am no more. I'm a thief. I'm a rotten sinner deserving of hell. He's saying there, what shall we speak to my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how shall we clear ourselves? Look at this. It's no more among themselves. God has found out the iniquity of thy servants. Amen. And this is where they're getting ready to be saved. All the self-righteousness is gone. They've been found out, the sack's been opened, and they've been exposed for who they really are. And the game is up. That's when you'll get saved. The fact of it is, uh, boy, I wish we had time just to dig in. But look at chapter 45. Look at that, circle that word, then. Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him, and he cried, cause every man to go out from me. 
and there stood no man with him while Joseph made himself known unto his brother. It wasn't until they confessed and come clean with themselves about their sin being before, uh, before and unto Almighty God, Joseph then revealed himself. And when you come to God and you say, God, I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. I can't earn my way to heaven. All I can hope in is your mercy. Would you save me? God will save you. Jesus Christ will pull the veil back and he'll reveal himself to you. And that's why you look at some people and wonder, boy, what have they got? What happened to them? Christ revealed himself to a broken, repentant, honest with himself sinner. And there's just some wonderful things right here, <clears throat> but it's then. Oh, get this. So, you got, so sometimes you wait a long time for them to get on. See, it's not God that God don't want to save them that day. We're the ones holding the train up because we, we keep trying to buy our way and justify ourselves and rationalize ourselves and trying to figure and double on our money and, and, and all kinds of junk. And all God's waiting on is for us to just get honest and say, what can I say? How can I clear myself? God's, God's found me out. Then Jesus reveals himself, not until. As long as you're lying about it, as long as you're trying to deceive yourself and God, he will not reveal himself to you. Then I want you to know something sweet. In verse number one of chapter 45, cause every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him. Now you listen to me. The night I got saved, it was like there was nobody in the room. I knew there were people there. Yes, I knew there were people there. But I met God. And God met me. And it was, this is honest truth. He caused every man to go out from me. I didn't care now what anybody thought. I wasn't afraid of what my friends thought. I didn't care what they thought. It was me and God. That's all that mattered. If you ever get there, you'll like it. And when God saves a man, he saves him individually and personally. He takes you. He's interested in you. Verse number three, and he, Joseph, wept aloud. He invites him to come near. Verse number, uh, verse number three, Joseph said to the brethren, I am Joseph. See, he's revealing himself to them, making himself known. And that's, I'm telling you, that's one of the great mysteries of Christianity is when Christ makes himself known to us. Doth my, brother, doth my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. And I'm going to tell you the truth about it is, when you come in the presence of Jesus, trouble. Why have I found grace in thine eyes? You ain't never met nobody like Jesus. Boy, I, there's so, so much good stuff here. I can't get it all. But verse number four, Joseph said unto his brother, if you're here tonight and you're saved, I want you to get this. Come near to me. I'd like for everyone to know tonight, he not only saves us, but he wants us to be near him. Yes. Come near to me, I pray you. I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Verse number five, now therefore be not grieved. They were grieved. They were troubled. Man, this is the guy we sold. This is the guy we sinned against. See, all of our sin, let me give you one of the greatest truths you ever get a hold of tonight. Every sin Reg Kelly ever, ever committed was initially and primarily against God Almighty. Yeah, I've sinned against people. But my sin, that's why David said, against thee and thee only have I sinned. Until you recognize that your sin is against God. And they were grieved. But here's what I want you to get. When you Get hooked up with Christ. He'll tell you not to be grieved. Why? Your sins are paid for. Amen. 
You're forgiven. You're saved. You're delivered. You're reconciled. It's taken care of. Be not grieved. By the way, here's a big one some of you ought to get a hold of. Nor angry with yourselves. If you're not careful, you spend most of your life being angry with yourself about how you messed things up or what you should have done or could have done or could have been. I'm going to tell you, when you, God saves you, he cleans the slate. Amen? Amen. It's over with. That you sold me hither for, and here's the thing, for God did send me before you to preserve life. Who sent Jesus? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten. He sent his son into this world to be the Savior. And boy, I tell you, you know what, what is he doing here with these men? They've received Christ. He is lifting their guilt and their shame and taking it away from their life. And I want to encourage you tonight, if you're saved, don't let Satan throw guilt and shame on you again. Oh, I understand that we ought not be proud of our past and maybe ashamed in a certain way, but as far as judicially guilty before God, we're not. They're paid for in Christ. If they're not, I'm lost tonight. I have no hope whatsoever. <clears throat> well, uh, just be real quick about this. In verse number seven, God sent me before you to preserve you posterity in the earth and to save your lives by great deliverance. The Bible said in the New Testament, how should we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Somebody ought to preach on, I will give you men a good title for a message, so great a salvation. Nobody in this world can describe how great salvation is. If you, if you and I have not seen the bowels of hell and the glories of heaven, we don't know how great salvation is. But he said, he said God, and God sent Jesus before us, right? Before the foundation of the world to preserve us and to give us a great deliverance. And so anyway, uh, chapter 45, verse number 15, look what he does. Moreover, he kissed all his brethren. Gives them a kiss of reconciliation. Um, by the way, you know, we were talking about the prodigal son earlier. How many knows what the prodigal son said, the first thing he said to his daddy when he got up there? I've sent. He said, make me one of thy hired servants. He thought he was going to earn it. Same thing. The prodigal son was having problems about understanding that salvation is free. It's a gift. You can't hire on to go to heaven. <laughs> and um, anyway, and then what did the father do with the prodigal son? Same thing Jesus did here. Kissed him, fell on his neck and kissed him. And then verse number 16, And the fame thereof was heard in Pharaoh's house, saying, Joseph's brethren are come, and it pleased Pharaoh well and his servants. And by the way, the Bible said in Luke 15, There's joy over one sinner that is saved. And they rejoiced in the Lord. And then verse number nine, we're about done with just two more things and we're done. Verse number nine, Joseph tells them, haste, go up to my father and say unto him, thus saith thy son Joseph, God hath made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down now unto me and tarry not. What's he doing? Look at verse 13. Ye shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt and all that ye have seen and ye shall haste and bring down my father. What's he doing? These guys just got saved. What's he telling them to do? Go back and tell folks back home who you found and what you found. Go soul winning. Go tell the world. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. What did Jesus do with that uh, gathering demonic man? He wanted to follow Jesus. And Jesus said, no. He said, you go home. Tell your friends what great things God has done for you. And God saves us. He wants us to tell other people. By the way, I don't know that I've ever seen anybody who got saved, but what didn't want other folks to be saved? There's something that happens inside you wants other folks to be saved. And yes, Dean. I know, I know we're out of time, but I, I got saved uh, 2,000 miles. In Germany. And uh, it was midnight when I, got, when I got back to the barracks. Everybody's in bed. 200 guys live in the bank. And with what you said, I roamed up and down the hallway trying to find somebody I could tell. I woke my buddies up. I couldn't help it. 
If you get saved, you got to tell somebody. That's right. Amen. That's right. You get saved, it'll come out of you. It'll come out of you one way or another. It doesn't mean that you maybe talk a lot, but I'll tell you it's going to come out one way or another. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. I wonder who's waiting on you and I the rest of this week or next week to tell them how we got saved and tell them where they can find corn and tell them it don't cost them a dime. The only thing it cost them is getting honest with God, Amen. repenting, humbling themselves and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And I'll tell you what, when God saves you, he'll put it in you to want other people to be saved. Now, then the last one is this. <laughs> no, I'll tell you what, if I want to leave one out, it'd be this one. I want you to look at verse number 24 in chapter 45. <clears throat> now, you and I have been sent in this world to, to proclaim the gospel. And by the way, you know, we all do, have a different part in it. We all are doing different things to get the gospel out. But he sent his brethren away. Now, what he, he sent them out, right? And D Jesus sent his disciples out. And he told the last thing he told them, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Now, watch what he says. I'm going to send you out, but here's what I want to tell you something. And they departed, and he said unto them, everybody look at this. Somebody tell me, what's it say? Anybody ever heard the term, well, they had a falling out? How many knows what that means? They got into a fuss, disagreement, and God, last thing, he, last thing Joseph tells them, what Jesus tell us, you know that you've passed from death into life because you love the brother. If you read anything in the New Testament, is he's trying to tell people, <laughs> Christian people, don't fall out. On the way. Wonder why Joseph didn't want his brethren to fall out on the, along the way. Anybody got any idea? I mean, that's the last thing he tells them. We'll send you up there. I want you to go tell people what you found. And he says, see that ye fall not out by the way. Well, number one, he knew them rascals. <laughs> that's an honorary bunch. He probably knew they fussed and fight. But what happens when Christians fuss and fight? Come on. What happens? Tell me a two, give me, name me three things that happen when Christians have a fallen out. And they don't share their salvation and what they've got. It's pretty bad. A man that is, 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 gets in this condition, I've been there many times. You're not much apt to tell nobody about Jesus Christ and share your faith when you're in that kind of condition, when your heart's messed up, and, and it may not even be your fault or whatever. But <clears throat> as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. I'm telling you, one of the things that God is saying is what, what happened in the book of Acts, they were in one accord and in one mind. And God just, how, how, how many of you ever had a fall night with your wife or your husband? <laughs> Nobody. One, two, three, four. Okay, there's a few. Uh, okay. <laughs> what is falling out? Okay, yeah. I mean, how wild does this get? Well, that's why people ain't raising their hand. I don't know if I should or. <laughs> Think we need to stop and say, honey, are we having a falling out? Because <laughs> God said for us not to fall out. She may have had a falling out, but I ain't never had a falling out. <laughs> but here's what I want to say to you this. Falling out can cause your message to get distorted or people not to even hear your message. Can you imagine those ten brothers coming back up there and they're stopping some town. They say, hey, man, there's corn in Egypt. Well, shut up. I'm going to talk to him about this. And they get in a fight. And they have a big falling out. And every once in a while they try to say, but there's corn in Egypt. You guys are stupid. Well, I, I've got enough fights in life without getting involved in your stuff. Here's, I just want to close saying this. As best we can, let's love one another. And by that I mean this, put up with each other. I've been so concerned about all these Minnesota peoples come in because they just, they just really think I'm nice and wonderful. And they just, oh, oh I tell you that, you know. Danny, and they're going to find out before long. I just know they're going to find out that I'm not. <laughs> I 
Josh, you're back row and back row. How long have you been here at this church? Since you were born? 25, 30 years. You ever had a falling out with anybody here at church? <laughs> it's not if. How many have? Listen, you're going to be in church. You're going to have situations. But God, Joseph knew. He said, hey, listen, guys, we ain't got time to be fussing and fighting. There's people need to know there's corn in Egypt. Well, let's stop. It, I, I don't know, but at least I got through it. Amen. That's a major accomplishment. Amen. Boy, I tell you. Isn't that something, though, how God wove that into the Word of God? Yeah. You know, and I hope this will help you. So you witness to people and you deal with people. Just give God time. Let the Holy Spirit do the work. See, the Holy Spirit's the one has to open the sack up. <laughs> See, preachers get up. We want to open the sack. But if the Holy Spirit's not behind us and with us opening the sack, we're wasting our time. We're just making people mad. Get out of my sack. All right? <laughs> 